Good evening, depending on where you're listening to us from. I'm Chuck Kelly here in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and welcome to our webinar on MPX over AES, also known as Omnia Direct. And I'm very glad you're all with us today. Um, we've got a number of things we're going to try to cover today. Uh, we're going to talk about the concept of AES over, or a multiplex over AES. Um, we've got with us two distinguished guests, Frank Foti, the CEO of Telos Alliance from Cleveland. Hello, Frank. Chuck, how are you today? Doing great, doing great. Thank you for coming back for another version of this uh, of this webinar. The last one was so popular, some people couldn't actually join us, so we decided we'd just do it again. So and we also have with us Brian Walker, one of the research engineers here at Nautel, and a very important person in the in the development of this because he was the first person to hear multiplex over AES. So we're going to get him to explain what's been going on too. So let's talk a little bit about the AES over uh, MPX, or MPX over AES, rather. But the first, uh, let me tell you how to ask questions in the GoToWebinar in, uh, toolbox on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, you've got the opportunity to ask questions, and you can go ahead and type those at any time, and we will do our best at the end of the webinar to answer those questions. Last time, we had more questions than we could possibly answer. So, uh, but it and it really surprised me. But anyway, um, we tried our best to answer those questions, and we will do the same today. First off, let me talk about how this all fits into the Nautel product line. Um, today, the um, MPX over AES technology works on the NV series, the bottom side of of your screen here, and we will talk about implementation uh, on our other FM products soon. Um, but this shows that the AUI, our advanced user interface, um, is, is what ties all the Nautel products together from our NX series up to 2 megawatts of transmitter power to our new TV transmitters, um, uh, UHF digital television, MD Light series, and the VS series. And this whole thing, this whole MPX over AES discussion started like most good ideas. Um, it started over a lot of red wine and some good Italian food in, in Madison, Wisconsin, and Frank and I and some of the other guys were sitting around and just said, gee whiz, you know what, this should ought to happen. This is just an idea that needs to happen. We need to make it happen. What do you think, Frank? Well, Chuck, um, uh, as, you, as you recall, I was in full agreement and um, I, I think it's poetic justice that you have a, a napkin up here because uh, there were a lot of great algorithms that were developed on the back of napkins with my late great business partner and colleague Steve Church, but this concept was something that um, I began working on back in 1998, and uh, basically I, I put it in layaway, if you will, because at the time it was an idea that a lot of people had interest in, but um, we did not have the um, let's say the firmware capabilities to make the it technology uh, wasn't universal. Ready. Right, it wasn't ready, and to make it universal so that it's ubiquitous among products and manufacturers and things of that nature. And as you're right, as we were sitting there talking, and you mentioned that oh, you know, our exciters will do, you know, it, it looks up to 192 kilohertz sample input. You know, can you stick the multiplex signal in that? As you know, I said, yeah, we can. As a matter of fact, I. I, I do that. I was I've been doing that for years already on my development system uh, at the office, and you said, "Well, why don't we do it by NAB?" This is, okay. I think, the key point. Uh, there's a lot of ideas that get to the napkin stage and then never come to fruition because I think the difference was you and I looked each other uh, across the table in the eye and said, "I'll bring it to NAB if you will." Well, yes, and and. Um, I say with respect to you and your group, you guys were the first per, first entity from the actual transmission side to say, hey, we're open to this, we're receptive to this. Uh, in years past, it wasn't that way. And that's why I chuckle when I hear people say, oh, yeah, we could have done that four years ago. Well, if they could have, then, you know, excuse my language, but why the hell didn't you do it four years ago? Yeah. We've yeah. been trying to yeah. do it since 1998. So, you know, um, again, uh, you know, it, it was. I remember going back to Cleveland, being all excited, 
over the fact that you guys are excited about it. And then, you know, your guys did a little bit of work in the background. We did some work in the background. And, you know, as Brian told us, he, you know, we sent him a unit, what, in March or April, he plugged it in, and boom, it was running. Yep. Brian, tell us about when that happened. Well, it was actually pretty uneventful, Chuck. I mean, took the processor out and hooked everything up, and right out of the box, we had everything working. And, and through the crackle of some headphones and a receiver nearby, you were able to hear, be the first person, really, to hear it through a commercial, in a commercial scenario, um, uh, MPX over ES. Yeah, that's true. And it's, it was pretty cool. And what was really cool is the next step, because we decided to call it Omnia Direct. And the next step, oh, and I also have to give a little credit to our, our, our guest here, Frank. Um, uh, Frank was the awardee of the Radio Engineering Achievement Award at this year's NAB. So I'm, 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 I'm honored to have you on the webinar here with me, Frank. But the coolest thing was when, where did it happen here? Where's, where's that slide? It must be further back after the, okay, so it's further back in the slide deck. But there's a, there's a time at which you, Frank, and, and, um, and Peter Conlon, our president, Stood up and did a press release in front of all of the uh, all of the press at NAB in our booth uh, the morning the show opened, and I never saw such an instantaneous reaction of interest not only from the customers from all over the world, but also from other companies who wanted to get in on this and make it work with their systems, whether it was their transmitters or their audio processors. Um, Chuck, I saw the same thing and. I think the last time when we did our little Chuck and Frank show, I remember the comment being that I think it literally was within the hour of the show opening, you had you know the other processing guys inquiring, hey, how can we do this? And likewise, we had the other transmitter guys going, hey, how can we do this? And um, you know, I was bowled away over by the excitement and interest by so many people that my thought at first was, you know, right now we, you know, um, we need to support our collective effort and, you know, as we'll explain later, you know, how we decided to um, publicly come forward with the idea to say, look, if you want to do it, you can. Uh, yeah, it, it required an extra little meeting that we didn't know we were going to have to have to sit and discuss this because originally it was just, this was going to be between Nautel and, and Omnia. And uh, we realized very quickly that I, I think that if, if we didn't just throw it open and make it a public standard, that there, the, the likelihood was that other people would create incompatible standards. And, and that would have been bad news for the broadcast engineer in the trenches. Chuck, I couldn't agree more. And one of the things that I personally have always admired about Nautel is that you guys are um, – you know, yes, all our companies are in business to make money. Uh, here, you know, a little plug there for capitalism. But you're, you're in it, my view has been you're in it for the betterment of broadcasting. And um, so are we. Um, we've been fortunate to have been on the front end of some leading technological advances, you know, Steve bringing MP3 into the United States. We've recent years have done some interesting things on the FM transmission side. but our driving factor has been that we want to do things for the betterment of broadcasting. So in the back of my mind, I remember thinking, well, it, it, you know, the, not knowing how the implementation might be going on in other exciters or transmitter products, thinking it's probably possible. And as you guys learned, you know, the other audio processing people were probably thinking, well, that we could probably generate that same signal because there's really not, not a lot of rocket science in what, we, what we're doing. Um, yeah, that, yes, we got together collectively and said, you know, um, there's there's more strength in the numbers of making it available so that it's ubiquitous. And yeah. I think it's been wonderful that, you know, to, even though we came about it individually and then teamed up, we both came to the same thinking on our own. And then it was, it was easy to say, yeah, um, we need to make this available to everybody. Yeah. And that's something I think both of us can be proud of. So, look, Frank, let's yeah. uh, let you talk a little bit about how we got where we where we are, and 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 what this technology really does for people. Sure. Um, these are some slides. Some of these slides uh, go back to when we first talked about this concept in the late 1990s. And before I get started, you know, because you know, one of the questions that comes up is that, well, you know, why did you wait so long? Well, some of it is a combination of 
waiting to see firmware become more common and um, to be able to do it at a much more cost-effective manner. Um, and then also, you know, seeing things start to um, is synergy among transmission, be it from processing or, or, trans, or transmitter side, to where we can make it do what we're doing. But the story as it is, this first slide shows um, back before, and I have to give credit to where credit is due, back to before there really was um, you know, the stereo generator in the audio processor, and Bob Orban was the first to do that. You know, we had discrete left and right analog audio going from the audio processing into an analog stereo generator where there was pre-emphasis and low-pass filtering. Um, and as we all know, it generated a lot of overshoots, inefficient modulation. Um, it, it worked, but, you know, there was no way to really get all that loud on the air. So um, from there, you know, the um, uh, world changed. I think the next slide will... Um, yes, um, this here is uh, a basic configuration that we've known for probably about 40 years now, where the stereo generator was, in, you know, embedded in the audio processor. We had uh, the composite signal coming out by way of a BNC connector, basically going directly into the modulator of an analog FM exciter. As we all know, this method works, uh, continues to work, uh, and has been extremely successful. Now. As we move forward into the digital world, and I think if we could jump to the next slide here, okay. Um, when the advent of digital came about, both in audio processing and in exciters, um, the concept to be able to bring the composite signal in the digital domain into the exciter, um, for some of the reasons I mentioned earlier, it, I don't want to say it wasn't possible, but it would have been extremely difficult. So. The way it was done was to, in a way, go back to that earlier um, method that I first described where we're coming out uh, of the audio processor using the AES CPU path, uh, discrete left and right. Uh, the choice of sampling rate, I've always said, was extremely low, which was 32 kilohertz. Connect that into the stereo generator and the digital exciter, and, and, and off you went. Now, um, there were some implementations of that that worked okay, but, you know, from someone who um, has a lot of history of competitive uh, broadcasting on the engineering side, it was never acceptable to me. And um, our early um, work in doing this, which was back with our Omni-FM uh, audio processor, it worked, but there were, there were overshoots, and um, independently of what anyone else is going to say, we were able to show that there were overshoots no matter what audio processor you were using. So I originally said, you know, if we're going to go digital, there's no reason why we cannot allow the stereo generator to remain in the audio processor in the digital domain and then have a way to couple into the digital exciter with the composite signal in the digital domain. As I mentioned earlier, we, we had something that was called DSET. It stood for Digital Composite Enabling Technology which really was digital cutting edge technologies, but because back then Omni was known as cutting edge. Right. Um, but it was a really a one-off way of going about it. For one manufacturer, we would have to have done it for differently for everyone. And it, it was starting to become too crazy that we just kind of figured we'll shelve it for now. Um, and as we've known for the last, uh, what, 20, 15, 20 years, being able to just hand off the analog signal has worked just fine. Now, if we go to the next slide, I need to explain where the challenge was in this process. And the challenge comes about based on, um, and this slide is showing a, a block overview of what is going on inside a digital audio processor uh, that's coupled by way of AES, EBU, left, right, into the digital exciter. Um, in our case, we never used a base sampling rate of 32 kilohertz sampling. We used a much higher sampling rate. Part of that was in order to uh, eliminate or to highly suppress any processing-induced aliasing uh, distortion that could be generated. But um, in this picture that you see on your screen, 
the challenge comes about in this one block here called the sample rate converter. What ends up happening is that the output of the audio processor, which has you know, precision peak control down to you know, maybe you know, one-tenth of one percent, when it goes through the sample rate converter, the sample rate conversion process will generate overshoots, and that's where the problem comes about. If we can jump to the next slide, I'll explain why that's actually happening. Here's um, basically an overview of what's happening in the sample rate converter. Uh, in the example um, um, that we can talk about here, if the input sampling rate is 40 kilohertz um, as a data input sample rate, we need to upsample that uh, so that we can eventually downsample it to a new sampling rate. And that's done by inserting uh, in the upsampling function uh, for every sample, we'll upsample it to a, um, uh, a times 10 factor. So basically for every sample, we're going to shove in a bunch of zeros for the next sample. And then later on, right after that, we have for, for inserting those zeros, if we don't insert the slow pass filter at the Nyquist frequency of the new sampling rate, we will end up with aliasing distortion. So we, it's this low pass filter here that shows at 16 kilohertz. That's the, the, that's the you know the gremlin, if you will, that generates the overshoots. Then after that, we've now created a new tighter um, pass band that we can downsample to the desired sampling rate. It's, it's this function here, the sample rate converter. When you try to pass tight peak controlled digital audio signals through, that's where the you know that's where the problems come about. So uh, and trying to get around this is is been very difficult. I know in some exciters they would put in a you know you know a downstream look ahead limiter, downstream clipper, or something. But as you know, every uh, additional stage of signal conditioning you're going to put in there in the form of clipping or or hard limiting or, or, or you know look ahead limiting, it's going to change the sound. And right. our our goal here was to get rid of this. Uh, how can we basically um, come about being able to um, bring the composite signal over in the digital domain. So this has basically been the challenge. And most of our customers uh, just would keep the uh, multiplex signal in the Omnia, keep it in analog, go into the exciter. And, and uh, if, if there's a, a gremlin there, it's that you know, we have to go from the digital domain back to analog. So there's a D to A conversion through the you know, BNC or the RG58 into the exciter, and then the exciter has to go A to D and uh, uh, back in the digital world. So we have a whole, you know, uh, one more stage of conversion going on. I well, think and there's we'll another thing, too, and that is that that, that RG58 is in an extremely noisy environment. Um, you've got yeah. ground loops, you've got RF fields, you've got magnetic fields. It's one of the noisiest environments I can imagine uh, in the transmitter yeah. side. And, and, you know, it doesn't take much to destroy your signal to noise ratio when you're talking about the kind of performance that most transmitters have today. That um, you know, Chuck, that, um, that's an excellent point. And and again, one of the advantages that um, uh, being able to have digital paths gives us is that basically from point A to point B, you know, we should be able to faithfully replicate uh, the signal from one point to another. So I think if, um, so. Here's some advantages. Uh, of you know we're calling it Omnia Direct or you know it's synonymous with MPX over AES. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we now have a 100% linear digital connection um, that's going from the output of the stereo generator to the modulator stage of the digital exciter, and it's again an anal analogous to what has been done for decades, um, you know, from the old analog stereo generators or the output of a digital processor that has the analog BNC, can, I'm sorry, multiplex connection into the a traditional exciter or di digital exciter. Uh, modulation control is fabulous. I mean, it's whatever is leaving the stereo generator is what is going to be faithfully handed off to the modulator stage. And if the modulator technology in the digital exciter is able to mirror what's coming in 100%, that's what's going over the radio. And, uh, There's a mathematical formula that defines everything from the output of the processor through RF, basically. Oh, sure. It really doesn't I mean, change. 
that, that, that is correct. Uh, some people have asked, you know, is there a sonic improvement? Uh, there is a sonic improvement. It, to some, it may appear subtle, but as you know, one of the things that has always been a bit of a, a challenge, if you will, is being able to get, you know, you know, amazing sounding bass on, on the radio. Um, that's, you know, one of the things that would always give up because, you know, in the, in the old days we had, you know, DC servos or uh, various things. Uh, matter of fact, there were, you know, a, a lot of it, uh, exciters had high pass filters, even though it was a very extremely low uh, cutoff to that high pass filter, there is some, some effect there. So basically now we're going from DC up through the pass band of the FM stereo baseband signal. So, you know, there is some sonic benefits. Uh, to our ears, it's been a tighter um, low end on the air. And the other part was that the high end seems to be a little smoother sounding. I, uh, as of yet, you know, I, 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 I don't have a, a scientific explanation to explain why that is. It may just be that, you know, removing yet again one more set of converters in place, you know. Actually uh, two, right? Like one A to D and or one D to A and one A to D. Yes, actually, I should say one conversion process, right. which does incorporate two converters. You, you are correct. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it, it, it this does eliminate the need for, you know, an onboard exciter limiter, as overshoots do not. I mean, there is no sample rate converting going on that can, you know, uh, become a flying ointment. And I, I think the other thing that's important to mention here, and, and Frank, you know this more than probably most people on the planet, and that is the incredibly competitive nature of audio processing in radio stations and the part that that audio processing and the smallest of differences can make in improving the overall air sound of the station and thus the performance of that station as a commercial entity. And, and I think the thing that's fascinating, and, and we've talked offline about this, Frank, um, is that, number one, it's very competitive, and number two, because it's so competitive, it's very secretive. So people are not going to let anybody mention what companies are interested or whatever, but you've had a tremendous amount of interest by really big radio stations and really big markets that are asking you to fly around and, and supervise the installation of this stuff. Uh, Chuck, you're right, and um, while I realize there have been some people to publicly talk about this tech or having this tech on the air um, in recent weeks, you know, not long after NAB, you know, the tech was on the air, um, much in the, let's say, stealth mode that you mentioned. I mean, there's a, uh, be it large broadcasters or small broadcasters, and I'm talking about broadcast companies, it is important, you know, and, um, you know, if, if we were to have published a list of the people using our products, it's a who's who of broadcasting throughout the world. And if we did yeah. that, I'd say, I'd say the greater majority of them, let's say 85 to 90 percent of them, don't want that mentioned. If we if we did it one time, we'd probably lose them all as customers. Well, that's so, the same people uh, who used to have used to have uh, locked closets where all the audio processing was going on. Uh, Chuck, I, I, you know, been there, done that. You know, yep. I, I we. We, we had a shade that came down over the processing rack at Z100 in New York, and, and we even had a different rack that had different equipment in it so that if people came in and they saw it, they'd say, oh, they're running this, that, and the other thing. And, and Competitive really was, disintelligence. You know, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I, I, believe me, I, I, I get it, I understand it, I support it, and that's why there's been no press releases from Omnia saying, we did this first because, I mean, uh, modestly, we did do it first, but it, 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 to me, that's immaterial. I understand, and 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 I'm just proud that all of these same companies that you're talking about apparently have Nautel transmitters to hook it up to. Yes, they do. <laughs> Let's continue on here. Sure. More advantages. Um, some of these kind of go without saying. So. Probably no need for me to to read about uh, you know mention about them. Um, one of the things I do want to mention you know I, you know it's in there. It does support the single sideband suppressed carrier operation. Um, it you know we know it's already in, in the Nautel product. Uh, 
we do know that in some cases throughout the world, people want to have a point to multi-point uh, distribution of their signal. This gives us that capability. Uh, the right. last webinar, somebody asked me what type of link would they need to be able to pass this. Um, I inquired, the Omni guys have told me, if you have a link that's 5.84 uh, gigabits or more, you'd be able to oh, do that. Oh, megabits, you said. Uh, megabits, I believe. You're right, uh, Chuck, I, I stand corrected. I should have left the email open. Uh, yes, me uh, um, um, megabits. So uh, there's that. And um, I think there was something else that just slipped my mind. But you know, um, this here is, is basically just some additional um, advantages that you do get by having, oh, uh, I'm sorry, I do remember. Uh, one of the things, because we've been asked about this, is we, um, with, with Omnia, we made two conscious decisions to hopefully, um, hopefully help the infrastructure of the broadcaster. One, the reason we've added a connector to the back of Omnia was that we did not want to have to repurpose any of the existing AES EBU connections because we know that there's going to be some infrastructure situations where they're going to want to have the MPX over AES dedicated and they still need those other connectors. And the other is I've been asked, uh, how are we going to be able to accommodate RDS? Well, one of the things that was designed into Omni 11, and it's it's you know one of those uh, yet coming things, is we're going to be, we're adding the RDS generator to the Omnia 11. So that um, AES over MPX connection will be able to transport the RDS signal as well. That's great. Now let's 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 talk specifically about what we introduced at NAB and 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 how it works and what do people have to do to make it work today. Okay. By the way, this sli slide you just brought up is now the digital equivalent of the slide I had earlier that had the um, analog BNC connector. Now what you have is the same footprint, but now everything's digital. As you can see there's AES, EBU into the audio processor. That could be analog if, if somebody so chose. But you know you have digital all the way in, digital all the way through. And basically, once it's RF, it's RF. So yep. there you have it. Yeah, and so this is a no compromise. A no compromise answer. In other words, in the past, you could have the absolute cleanest signal if you wanted to come out left and right AES EBU and go straight into the exciter. But if you wanted the loudest signal, you wanted to take advantage of all of the good things that the Omnia and other good processors do in the stereo generator and post the stereo generator, you had to go back down to analog and come back up. And this way, you got the best of both worlds, no compromises. Yep. yep. Okay. So. Tell us how difficult it is. Tell us if you explain the rocket science one has to do to connect up an Omnia 11 to a Nautel NV series. Um, you need to have a cable that has XLR connectors on either end. You plug it in. Um, you know the the signal is there natively at the output of the uh, Omnia, or I, I, I'm imagining it'll be there natively at the output of uh, you know if there's a uh, somebody's choosing to use a different audio processor, yep. and, and and I believe you have a slide that'll show how easy it is, how, and plus how many tools you're going to need. You know, I mean, it's probably a, a, a you know a large toolbox of you know being <laughs> facetious here. It's called your yeah. Tool. We're having fun. It's all you do is you go to you get the latest software version for the MV, uh, which I believe is 4.02. You download it, you install it according to the instructions, and then you've got a new pull down uh, for the audio choice and you just simply select MPX over AES and you're done. There you and go. It's, it's, it's that simple. So, yes it is. So we came to NAB and you and Peter um, explained all this to everybody and uh, the world came unglued. So that was fun. Yes, and it's still fun actually. It is still fun. So and this, this is the pull down you were mentioning. This is a screen capture from the MV series uh, for MPX over AES. So now we're going to get to um, the, the fact that this has grown well beyond uh, just our two boxes, the MV and the and the and the Omni. And the questions that people ask are: first off, what about other uh, Omnia boxes? Um, 
Are there, will this be supported on other Omnia processors? Well, the Omnia 6, there's no more um, instructions that we could shove into that. You know, so the earlier family is, um, we won't be able to support that. Okay. Um, the Omnia 1, the, you know, that, that, that's a question that the engineering team needs to, you know, go back and answer. And right now I've got them, I should, myself and Cornelius Gould, we've got, we got that team working pretty, they're pretty busy on a number of projects right now, so we have to get that answer. Uh, yep. The Omnia 9 will do it. Um, so Omnia 9 and Omnia 11 are um, able to do MPX over eight, yes. Super. And then from our side, um, and, and this is breaking news, nobody's heard this before, not even the people that came to the very first webinar, and I'll let Brian explain that, that he was doing some work um, on, on making this work for other products, products of Nautels. So we're currently in the process of uh, testing this uh, with the NB light transmitters. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had to make a couple of minor tweaks to the hardware in order to uh, get this to work. So it does require a new version of the uh, exciter card right. um, if it's going to be used, but uh, it's going to be there in all product going forward. Yep. And uh, as soon as we have uh, the NVLite 4.1 software out, mm -hmm. it will be supported in that. And that's expected within the next couple of weeks. It should be, yes. Yep. And then there's not that much difference between the NV Light and the VS series. So what could people expect coming? If this is going to happen in the VS series as well? Yes. Uh, once we've got finished with the testing on the NV Lights, uh, it's essentially the same platform, so that should roll over then over to VS. Okay. And uh, we're expecting to be looking at that sometime in the fall. Now, on the NV Light and the VS, so if you have an older unit, you may have to change out the exciter card because there's a trace missing. Uh, but the other thing is that you needed to, you needed to turn off the SCA when you implement this feature. Right, and that is one compromise that we've had to make just for the time being. Uh, okay. Is that uh, because this is fairly processor intensive sure. and so on, uh, the SCA the internal SCA generators won't be available. Right, you, when you're still in this mode. you could still connect in an external SCA generator and it would still work, and, and you could still use it. If you're not doing MPX over AES, you can still use the SCA generators. It's just that if you're trying to do MPX over AES and SCA, you can't use the internal generator. Yes. Okay. All right. So that's full disclosure on that side. So we hope to cover all of the FM transmitter current product lines at Nautel within the next couple of months, and that's, that's pretty exciting. And I, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people very happy about that. Now, Frank, in our, in, our, in our generosity of explaining all of this, other transmitter manufacturers are already making moves to em embrace this, and I believe some already have it on the air, and other audio processing manufacturers have already embraced this. In fact, most of the audio processing manufacturers that I know of are already embracing this. So this is going to be a worldwide standard, and it, and in fact, already is a de facto standard. Yeah, and, and basically, the one thing I you know, we probably need to mention is what we're doing here is, as I said at the onset, it's not deep rocket science. You know, um, the ability to have 192 kilohertz sampling. Um, I mean, I, I'm doing this with you guys using a MacBook Air, and I know that the converters in my MacBook uh, will do 192 kilohertz sampling. So what we're doing is we're basically handing the signal off in the AES path uh, using a standard method. So as long as you have a connection um, from point A to point B that will support 192 kilohertz sampling, we'll make this happen, and be it our product or you know other processor products. Great. And we've already had interest from other processor manufacturers who tested with our product, and it worked. No surprise, it just worked. And, and that's, that's I'm not wonderful. surprised either. Now, one of the things that's interesting is there is a component of this that applies also, as you just mentioned, to... AES uh, STL links. So we have Mosley and others who are being asked by the customers, our common customers, uh, to to support this. And I think there's work going on in that in that area as well. Yes, there is. And um, something I, I believe I made mention of this the last time we were on is the megabit number I gave was based on a sampling rate of 192 kilohertz sampling. Right. One of the things. Um, 
we're, we're doing some research on is remember that 192 kilohertz sample rate is taking advantage, you know, provides two channels, a, you know, a left and right or a channel one, channel two situation. And we're in essence throwing half of that away. Right, and, and there are ways of using both sides of the 192 kilohertz sample channel to um, be able to obtain the usage of the full 99 kilohertz bandwidth that MPX, you know, that MPX can have. Remember, at 192 kilohertz sampling, your Nyquist is at 96 kilohertz. So there's a right. there's a three kilohertz domain that some broadcasters may like or may wish to have, because the example being if somebody was running a 92 kilohertz sampled FCA. The sure. reason I'm mentioning this is that there could be a way to take and, and but this would only allow the usage of one channel um, at 96 kilohertz sampling that we parse the 192 into two 96 kilohertz sampled segments, put part of it on channel one, part of it on channel two, and then, you know, w with some glue logic, put it back together at the transmitter site. The reason I mention that is that that would, you know, be able to be done utilizing a link that would be less than 5.84. Sure. It would make it a little easier. But that, it right. It would make it easier, but I, I do need to say here and now that hasn't been done and and it's work that you know is you know that's one of the things that's on the drawing board that that, that will need to be looked at. Yeah, so and it, it, it may be one. it may be that that would be the domain of of, of somebody like Mosley to implement. Who knows? Possibly, possibly. So now, and, one and, of the and, questions and that was asked that several times. Go ahead. No, I was saying we do know that Mosley has asked questions about the tech, and yeah. and they're sharp guys. So I'm. Oh, yeah. I, I'd imagine, you know, and they may even have an answer about it, you know, now. I, I, we just haven't been in contact with them in recent weeks. One of the questions we were asked actually several times last week, Frank, uh, or a couple of weeks ago, you'll recall, was about live wire and whether or not AES, uh, MPX over AES could actually be transmitted via live wire. Um, yes, that, that question has come up not only in the last webinar, it's come up privately. Um, Greg Shea, who was one of the, the chief scientists and developers of Livewire, is um, you know uh, on his to-do list. Uh, it tells me that you know it's something he feels we can do. It's it's just a matter of how they rearrange things in the Livewire world to make that happen. So okay. uh, you know it, it's it, it's a specific answer I don't have today, but I would say if anyone has interest. You know, hit me offline, or you know, hit me in up, upcoming weeks, and, and and I'll be able to get an answer. Now, going all the way back to the first one of the first slides with the napkin, uh, we've already scheduled another uh, sit down at that same Italian restaurant in Madison for this year, and we will uh, try to figure out where, what other creative and innovative things uh, we can do with with enough red wine. Well, I'm I'm sure there'll be plenty. We're not going to be bored. Oh, gosh, no. So now we get to go and, and check out the questions that people have asked. And let me see if I can see what's going on. And what type of STL system would be needed if the processor would be located at the studio? I think we've talked about that. You need 5.8 megabits per second or something like that is what you said? Right. And, and, and remember, STL today can mean a radio or can mean, you know, some digital link that goes from point A to point B that could That's be right. You know, I mean, STL is back to being some type of digital lines or could be some type of radio. Yep. And um, Matt asks, um, are there any plans for the Omnia 1 to support MPX over AS with future software updates? And you pretty much answered that, I believe. Yes. Again, that's, you know, um, that, that's on the to-do list, and uh, we don't have that answer as of yet. And another question that I think you've answered. Uh, will the Omni 11 not transfer RDS over the MPX AES in link if you're using a standalone RDS encoder? A standalone RDS encoder? Uh, That's interesting. You know, uh, well, what I mentioned was that the yeah, uh, you're going to build it into the yeah yeah. Well, you know, we're basically going to build it into the Omnia. So so that would require what he's suggesting. What Matt's suggesting is that you would require an RDS input in the processor so that the processor could add it to the rest of the stuff and ship it over. 
Well, what it would what it would require is that there would need to be a high speed A to D converter, um, yep. and and we feel it'd be a lot easier to just as compared to have to add more hardware, which adds more cost. We'll just put in the software, and you know, um, if anything, we're eliminating one more piece of equipment that can fail in somebody's rack. And my suspicion is that Matt would agree with you. So that's a that's a good answer, I think. Uh, Tyler is asked, I love it the fact that we've already answered most of these questions. Uh, what kind of cable is needed to interconnect? Now we got called out last week or a couple weeks ago, Frank, because we said just a mic cable will work with the XLR right. connections on both sides. But to be to be fair and honest, 110 ohm yes, uh, AES correct. cable is preferred. That is correct. And is there a max length to that cable? So yes, Which, you know, and, and again, you know, what's that? Uh, is there a maximum length to an AES EBU cable? I don't know the answer. Um, I, I'm sure. I, I, I'm sure there is. Yeah, uh, I don't know what it is though. You know, I. I okay. Yeah, I. I um, that number doesn't come to mind right now. I, you know, somebody. No. I, I know I'll get a copy of all the questions. I'll get them an answer. Yeah, um, and. Also, there's another question, and you, you've answered this, about the Omnia 6 uh, being upgradable, and it's just not, it's just not old enough, it's too old, rather, to allow that to happen. Right. Um, uh, okay, it says, what's the best practice with a digital STL, uncompressed or compressed? To make use of this technology, it must be uncompressed. Yep. Otherwise, you're going to create overshoots. Yep. Okay. Will the newer Nautel transmitters run dynamic RDS? Well, that's not a question that involves all of this. We are we have dynamic RDS support in the in the transmitters. However, it doesn't meet some of, of uh, people's requirements, and we're we're working on that area at this point in time. Is that a fair answer, Brian? That's a fair answer. Yes. Okay. And let's see. I have an engineer friend who would be very interested in this technology. When can we expect? This uh, presentation to be available on the Nautel YouTube channel. Okay, well that's a, a nice plug. Thank you. Um, usually we get this up on on uh, on the YouTube channel and on um, and our website, which would be www.nautel.com forward slash webinars, within a couple of days of the webinar. So you should be expecting to see it there, and you can download it and share it and all that sort of thing. Thanks for the thanks for the comment, and that's all the questions, Frank. So. Um, I uh, I think we're pretty much done. Here's the links for all the places you can get information from Nautel, from our YouTube channel, our webinars, our Nautel Waves newsletter. Don't forget that we're on uh, Facebook and and uh, and all that sort of thing as well. And uh, there's lots of good information there. You can reach us via our website at nautel.com or sales at nautel.com. There's a, a list of the. Uh, a friendly, happy bunch that, uh, that would be very delighted to assist anybody with questions about this. And Frank, there's your own thank you page. Yep. Um, and I, I want to say thanks to you, Chuck, and your crew, and, and and all the folks who joined us. And by the way, that picture there of the steam engine, that's where I'm doing the webinar today. Is um, Wednesdays are, are the work sessions out at the railroad. So I, you guys have just saved me from about an hour of ballasting track. Awesome. Awesome. Well, enjoy the, enjoy the lovely day. I hope it's a great day in Cleveland. Enjoy the trains. And thank you, Frank, for being a part of our webinar. And, it is. and thanks to the audience as well. And with that, thank you, thank you all. And, and uh, I, I look forward to any other. No. Thanks again. Thank you, Frank. Take care. Bye, everyone.